friend would be his younger brother, Adolf. The family moved briefly to New York, but by the time John was five, his father had succumbed to the lure of California and the gold fever that had taken hold. Arriving in San Francisco, they found the opportunities to be endless, especially as the railroads were starting to cross the nation. Klaus couldn't help but notice the high price of sugar due to its being shipped from Hawaii to the East Coast for refining and then back west again. Seeing the profit to be made, he organized the first sugar refinery on the West Coast in 1863, an operation that he would control and build with such force and energy that he would become known as the Sugar King, including cane and beet refineries and a virtual monopoly on the Hawaiian sugar production. The family began to accumulate great wealth, and John D. grew up in a world of extravagance and power, but always with an emphasis on hard work. When he was 23, he is sent to Hawaii to develop a sugar plantation for his father. A year later, he married Lily Seaman, and they, along with their four children, would make Hawaii their second home. Would you like to have that as your little second home? For nearly two decades. And John and his younger brother, Adolf, joined forces to become commercial importers, operating sailing vessels between Hawaii and San Francisco, later even including passenger ships. The family would become entrenched in the social life of the island, and the king, Kalakaua, known as the Merry Monarch, because he loved a good time. Thank you. That's the Merry Monarch. He would eventually become embraced by the Spreckles family to the point that rumors would later abound that he had offered to sell the islands to the family. There were two things that John Spreckles often claimed he was most passionate about. One was music. The other was sailing. It was the latter that would bring him to Coronado. He owned one of the best yachts in the Pacific, the luxurious schooner, the Lurleen. He was pleasure cruising off of San Diego one July, 1887, when, as he would tell the story, the icebox door was accidentally left open and he needed to replenish at the time. San Diego was teetering on the edge of financial disaster. The Great Santa Fe Railroad had promised that the city would be its western terminus, and real estate was booming. But the railroad changed its mind. It veered north to a godforsaken place called Los Angeles. <laughs> And immediately, the so-called great bust of the 80s began here. Real estate was valueless. The city fathers, noting the arrival of Spreckles, saw an opportunity of financial investment. And they approached him when he stepped ashore, offering him a free war franchise. John Dee was taken with the climate the challenge, and perhaps more than a little, the idea of building a town as his father had built and controlled San Francisco. And so it began. John D. accepted the offer and soon installed a coal bunker by the wharf. This was a major step because the Santa Fe had said they wouldn't even send a spur line down to San Diego if coal were not available. Spreckles was the hero of the hour. And as he looked across the bay, he could see the great hotel on the island of Coronado under construction, only half completed. And work on it had virtually stopped since it has, was being built using revenue from the sale of the land, income that also had stopped. Spreckles decided to lend the money to finish the grand hostelry and it is thanks to him that the hotel opened on time, February 1888. 
But within three years, by 1890, Spreckles had lent so much money to the struggling resort that he decided to forgive the debt and take full ownership of the island. This included North Island and the Silver Strand, as well as the ferry and the trolley and the water and the electric. So even though part of his heart would always be in Hawaii, he was about to create and cherish his own enchanted island. Across the bay, he was investing heavily as well and developing San Diego into the kind of city that he envisioned. He financed the building of dams and reservoirs, of street railways, of theaters and amusement spots such as Belmont Park and Mission Beach. Yet still, he did not live here. He maintained his home in San Francisco, traveling back and forth on his private yacht. However, all that was about to change. At 5.15 on the morning of April 18, 1906, the earth erupted and San Francisco became 490 blocks of ruin. It was then that Spreckles decided to move here permanently to what we all think of as firmer ground. <laughs> and to only construct buildings out of steel reinforced concrete. He commissioned architect Harrison Albright to design two houses for him, one to overlook the bay and the other the ocean. And both houses were completed by 1910. The bayfronting mansion is now, of course, the Glorieta Bay Inn and maintains, fortunately for all of us, much of the ambience and decor of Spreckles' era, including the music room, which once housed his personal pipe organ. Now I have to tell you guys something. As fate stepped in about a week ago, this pipe organ stayed in this Spreckles' home, the Gloria Bay Inn, until the 1970s, when it was finally sold off. It was redone, restored, changed owners a few times, and then we lost it. We didn't know where it was for almost two decades. But a week ago, we found it. It is in the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. It is played almost daily by the Eastman Musical Theater Group, the kids that are, are trained there. So yes, John D. would be very, very happy. Becoming a permanent resident meant that John D. dominated the political and financial life of San Diego and Coronado more than ever. He would build up much of San Diego's downtown, owning all the property on the south side of Broadway. He would be the major force behind the 1915 exposition in Balboa Park to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal and hopefully lure shipping here to our ports. His great organ pavilion installed for that event is still entertaining the populace today. And by the way, none of it worked. The ships just bypassed us and went on to Los Angeles. So we got the organ pavilion, but they didn't get the ship. He would propel Coronado into being one of the most famous resorts in the world. With the fairy tale hotel attracting the wealthy and the well known, he promoted such attractions as yachting and polo, and for the less privileged, Tent City. Our favorite, right? He, in 1909, he built the Coronado Public Library, and in 1917, picked up the With the financial help of his brother, Adolf the Spreckles building that housed his personal bank, the emergency hospital, the first theater and city hall. Its distinctive design and beauty would go on to depict the downtown that we have always known and loved. He donated the land that would become one of our community treasures 
and which would be named for him after his death, Spreckles Park. His new luxury yacht, the 226-foot Venetia, would be anchored in Gloria Bay, where he had easy access for the numerous sails he loved to take. The Venetia would be converted into an auxiliary cruiser during World War I, sent to the Atlantic, and used there to tow submarine chasers. Spreckles loved that she was credited with sinking two enemy subs, one of which was said to have been that which sunk the Lusitania. He was so enthralled by the claim that he would personally publish 300 editions of her war saga entitled Avenger of the Lusitania. Probably of all the Herculean endeavors undertaken by John Dee, it was the construction of the so-called impossible railroad, meant to finally hook San Diego up to a direct line to the east. That would be the most challenging. The obstacles were staggering. A personal cost of $18 million, 21 mountain tunnels needed, diplomatic negotiations with Mexico required to allow, allow the rail to go through part of their country, and even nature refused to cooperate, frequently flooding newly laid tracks. Do you know that PBS did a program called The Impossible Railroad? So you must watch that. It's been on. And also, our railroad museum in Balboa Park has a total model of this incredible, impossible railroad. Yet on November 18, 1919, Spreckles was able to drive in the Golden Spike at Carrizo Gorge, marking the end of the San Diego, Arizona Railroad that would open up the Imperial Valley, terminating in Yuma. It was history making. Yuma was connected to Chicago, which made us a transcontinental railroad. John D. never stopped planning and dreaming, even as age set in. There was always something on the drawing board, including a bridge to link San Diego to his beloved island of Coronado a plan that would not see fruition for another four plus decades. His personality was said to have been a body sense of humor, a love for practical jokes. He cared little for so-called society, preferring instead the company of a few well-chosen friends and family. I do recall that in the 1980s, an author looking for a possible book on him came here, interviewed us a lot, said, you know, this was one of the wealthiest men in the United States. He owned one of the most important hotels in the world. He knew every movie star. You guys have, must have heard a little something about him, a dalliance here or 